I. So, this time I want to talk about something different. Linear thinking people are going to see the first couple of episodes <laughs> and they're going to think that I'm going to go on ranting about external things. But no, that's not my style. But let them think that way. That way they won't get the uh, deeper topics that we're going to discuss here. I want to talk about a very popular widespread misconception. And that is the difference between concentration and meditation. Now, it's very basic. In concentration, you narrow the mind. The idea is to attain one-pointed focus. But in meditation, the mind opens, but still remains calm and focused. See, in normal experience, in normal conscious, ordinary consciousness, let's say, when the mind opens, there's a lot of noise, a lot of interference, a lot of uh, chaos, disharmony. So we try to uh, get conceptual harmony as opposed to conceptual dissonance by narrowing the range of attention to a systematic domain of which we have an ontological understanding. So we measure things in terms of the body, in terms of social uh, values, things that are measurable in a very gross way, to try to understand where we are and what we are and what to do. So this carries over into our spiritual work. And when we begin so-called meditation, with things like tratak. Tratak means glancing or staring at a candle flame or at a finger and holding the gaze steady. This, of course, develops concentration. Concentration in yoga is called dharana. And there's a distinction between dharana, concentration, and dhyana, or meditation. Whereas in Buddhism, for example, only the term jhana is used, and jhana, of course, is derived from dhyana. But in most cases, it actually means concentration. Dharana, focusing the mind, narrowing the mind, aiming the mind at one specific thought, or basing the mind in one specific ontological context. Each of the classic Eight jhanas talked about in the suttas are actually forms of concentration. The Buddha sometimes calls them bases. And why is that? Because they serve as bases or contexts for the mind and for evaluating other thoughts and concepts. So in jhana, we're concentrating the mind, narrowing the mind. Uh, for example, the fourth jhana is equivalence, equanimity, neutrality, detachment, neither good nor bad, neither right nor wrong, neither this nor that. So in that stage, in that space, what are we doing? We are closing the mind to all other interpretations, to all other systems of value, and we're judging only in terms of how does this help my equanimity, my detachment, my peace. This is samatha or shamatha meditation. But of course we find in the world <laughs> there's a lot of chaos. Peace is like a very rare thing or an artificial thing. 
until we actually attain equanimity. And once we have real equanimity, we can go in the midst of the marketplace or in the midst of any situation and still remain calm, peaceful, shamatha. So what is the difference? When we are closing off our mind, narrowing our context and our focus, then we're trying to get rid of distracting elements, aren't we? We're trying to focus down until there's only the thing we're interested in. But that makes us vulnerable because if anything changes, then our meditation or concentration will be disturbed. It's conditional. Conditional upon narrowing of the attention. But what about when the attention expands? Then we lose our peace, isn't it? So, real peace, real samatha, real equanimity is when we can tolerate all kinds of action going on around us. There's a secret to this. And the secret is in what Buddha called themeless meditation or themeless contemplation, concentration. And this is real meditation. Why? Everything can change and it doesn't disturb it. Well, how is that? Shariputta describes it very nicely in the Shariputta Sutta. He says, I was contemplating, but I was not contemplating earth in relation to earth, water in relation to water, air in relation to air, fire in relation to fire, mind in relation to mind, nothing in relation to nothing, emptiness in relation to emptiness, perception or non-perception, in relation to perception or non-perception. I wasn't contemplating any of those things. So then Ananda, who is asking him about this, says, well, then what was it? And he, he says, well, I tried to describe it. The thought that when there is no becoming, there is Nibbana. Nibbana is when there is no becoming. When that thought arose in my mind, that thought ceased in my mind. Huh? It came into manifestation and then it disappeared. Manifested and then unmanifested. Yet, Shariputta says, I was aware, I was precipient. What does this mean? His perception is not conditional upon there being things to perceive. Things may arise in the mind and things may go away. That doesn't change anything. Just like this morning I was down by the ocean. And of course, the ocean is the vibration of the sea, the water on the planet Earth. Huh? Every few seconds, another big wave comes rolling in. So, like every object, the ocean has a resonant frequency. And when energy is put into that system by the wind, by the weather, by the sun, by the moon, by gravitation, uh, the sun and the moon moving around the earth from the earth's point of view. This creates vibrations. It resonates at its natural resonant frequency, which is about one cycle every five to 10 seconds. In a big sea, in a big storm, it can be more than that, but on the average. So this one cycle per five to 10 seconds is the natural resonant frequency of the ocean. Now, is the ocean the waves? No. The waves are a phenomenon that appears on the ocean or in the ocean, but the waves are not the ocean. The waves come and the waves go but the ocean remains. 
Starting to get what I'm talking about? So in this samadhi, in this themeless concentration, the, the mind remains, the attention or consciousness, awareness or perception remains. Phenomena come and go. Phenomena arise and pass away. But everything is ultimately the same. That's real shamatha. That's real equanimity. The mind is open. We're not blocking anything from any direction. Everything, whatever is there, is just arising and passing away. The mind that can hold both the arising and the passing away is like the ocean that can hold both the beginning and the end of the wave. The ocean is not disturbed. The mind is not disturbed, because why? The arising, existence, and passing away adds up to zero. It was zero before it arose, and it's zero after it disappears. You know? The whole cycle of paticca samupada, dependent arising, being and becoming, simply is zero, big zero, big circle. That's how the Japanese Zen people represent it, too. So this world is going on, arising and passing away. But if the mind is simply open, without boundaries, then the whole cycle of manifestation is present within the mind, and it adds up to zero. Easy come, easy go, right? (laughs) So what it means that equanimity, real equanimity, is not from concentration, it's from opening the mind. Because when we open the mind, there's no effort. It's non-doing. It's relaxation. It's not concentration. Relaxation, not closing and narrowing the mind, it's opening the mind. So when the mind is open, things may come, things may go. But since the mind holds both their origin and their dissolution, they are ultimately zero. This is called emptiness. It's not non-being. Non-being is the opposite of being. Huh? Just like disappearing is the opposite of arising. They're both part of one thing, the cycle of dependent origination, paticca samupada. But what I'm talking about is when the whole process itself ceases, both arising and passing away, both being and non-being, cease. Because they add up to zero. So, then how do we, uh, how do we develop the illusion that things really exist? Well, the answer is something called vortexes. Vortex, if you didn't take uh, physics up to uh, thermodynamics and, and all of that, or hydrodynamics. A vortex is when there's a flow, and the flow encounters an obstacle. I'm going to show you a video clip here about what happens when there's an obstacle in the way of a flow. It starts to curl around, as you can see, and gradually forms pockets of circular flow. These are vortexes. And around those vortexes, there's a friction between the structure of the vortex and the flow. When the flow hits an obstacle, it tries to bend back around it. And because of that, it creates a friction within the flow. And that friction is in the shape of a vortex, a whirlpool. 
the Buddha says that one attains Nibbana when the whirlpool ceases. So when the vortex becomes still, then that's Nibbana. Anyway, <laughs> don't want to bliss out here, you know, on network TV. Um, how to explain this? Think of a wave, think of surfing. I'm going to play a nice surfing video here. The wave is the energy passing through the ocean, making vibrations. Then the vibration hits an obstacle, the shore. <laughs> it hits the land. And when it hits the land, it bounces back. So then these two currents, the inbound and the outbound, hit each other and begin to form a circular motion called a vortex. And that's a wave. Surfers love these vortexes, they call tubes. <laughs> yeah, man, the tubes were gnarly, you know. So, um, when you get in the middle of one of these vortexes, then you can surf without disturbance, even though there's all this turbulence around you. And the turbulence, what it does is, it's like fake matter. It's, it's energy crystallized into a certain form. And it's like fake matter. It, it has the same effect as mass without having mass. It's really strange. So if you get caught by a wave, it's called a wipeout. Ah, wipeout! Right? So what is that? A wipeout is when you get caught in the turbulence around the edges of the vortex and flipped. Huh? You lose your directional stability. Happened to me this morning. I was body surfing and I, I was getting up on a wave and I got a little bit too close to the vortex and spun out. <laughs> Only sand, nice soft sand, so nothing to worry about. But still, if you get caught in the vortex, in the turbulence of the vortex, it has much more power than uh, just the water by itself. Now, on the other hand, if you can stay in the middle of the vortex, surf right down the tube, then you're okay, you're good. So, what does this have to do with meditation? <laughs> okay. We are a collection of energy flows. We talk about chakras. And of course, chakras are just another map just another system of classification of phenomena. Okay, so we have all the chakras and the nadis and these energy flows and chi and all this stuff, right? Prana. What is it all doing? Well, it depends on whether we're being outward flowing or inward flowing. Outward flowing is yang, masculine, doing. Inward flowing is yin, feminine. It's allowing, non-doing, letting things happen. So you can look at the I Ching, for example, as a representation of the six lower chakras, whether they are flowing in or out. When the I Ching gives you a yang line, the energy is flowing out. When it gives you a yin line, the energy is flowing in. Think about it sometimes. Of course, the seventh chakra doesn't apply because it's non-dual. But the other chakras, either they flow out or they flow in. Now, in our society, we are socialized to flow out. It's called compulsive extroversion, and we're trained up like that in school. So the normal condition, especially for a Western male, is outflowing through all the chakras, all the time. <laughs> and for a female, well, they're allowed to be a little inflowing in the heart chakra, maybe, you know, 
or in the sex chakra. That is encouraged. Everything else is discouraged. But real meditation, really deep meditation, the kind that results in enlightenment, is when all the chakras are flowing inward. Yin, feminine. So real peace, real shamatha, real meditation, is when the doors of the chakras open and the energy can flow in without any restriction. That's meditation. Concentration is when we narrow the doors of the senses, concentrate the attention on a particular phenomenon, and the energy is flowing out, going toward that phenomenon. You see the difference? So enlightenment happens at the peak of meditation. And meditation being an inward flow, it's a, it's a, a spontaneous the feminine, natural happening. It can't be done. You can't sit there and do enlightenment. You can't even do meditation. It's a non-doing. It happens when the energy is flowing out, suddenly relax and begin to turn inwards. So every meditation method that there is simply is a way to turn the energy from outward flowing to inward flowing, especially the third eye. Uh, that's why there are so many um, visualizations, concentrations, mental bases, and so on like that in the various paths. Simply to get you to create something inside and, and look at it. <laughs> Because, of course, it's very, very difficult to look at what's really there. <laughs> That's the next stage. That's a higher stage. After we go through these synthetic meditations and visualizations and so on, then we start to become actually aware of what's inside us. And, of course, that's the dark night of the soul. You have to pass through the dark night of the soul to get to what's behind it, which is, of course, is pure awareness, pure bliss. When mind concentrates on itself and inquires into its own nature, there is a spontaneous upwelling of transcendental bliss. It's the only way I can describe it. Okay, so real enlightenment happens when we get out of the turbulence around the edges of the vortex and go into the empty center and relax and let everything flow in at us, knowing that it, it can't do anything to us. We're just a space. Space is not changed by the things that go through it. Space is always the same. Emptiness is incorruptible indestructible, uncreated, eternal, unconditional, absolute. <laughs> so that's Nibbana. So I'll be talking more about vortexes in the next couple of episodes, I think, <laughs> unless something else comes up. <laughs> But uh, I promised a long time ago that I was going to talk about vortex theory, and I never really got to explain everything. So I do want to go through it a little bit more and bring up its deep connection with Paticca Samuppada. For those of you who take this stuff seriously, really want to learn it and apply it in your lives so that, that you can also attain this uh, meditation spontaneous samadhi, enlightenment, nibbana.